Greetings, my brethren. How are you doing today? Uh, very happy to see you all here. Uh, bear with me one second, because this window here needs its blind closed. Otherwise, it's going to block out me. So I take my microphone off. There we go. Thank you for that. How are you all doing? Ah, uh, been very, very hot here. Over 40 degrees for the last five or six days. But uh, but it's summer in Australia, and that's what you get. Uh, so uh, we're going to be studying, continuing to study from the, the parables of Jesus. And today we are studying the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, which is a, a wonderful parable, as, well, they all are. Uh, so let us start. Uh, Vincent, could I ask you if you wouldn't mind uh, unmuting yourself and opening with a prayer for us, please? Okay, okay. okay. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious Father who in heaven, and Father, we thank you once again for this time that we all get together and study the portion of your words. And we thank you for this time that we can continue to learn from thy teachings and commandments. And also, once again, pray that you'll be perceived and the, the lesson will be well conducted. We all will be able to benefit from it and edify edifying to all of us and pray for the rest who are coming in and you also bless them their effort so that they can all study together this is uh, our humble prayer in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen amen thank you very much thank you very much okay so we are in uh luke chapter 10 uh, what we're going to do is we're going to read the uh, the parables first, or the parable rather. Uh, it's in Luke chapter 10, uh, and we're going to start in verse 25. Okay, so notice uh, what we read there. Uh, now, what we, what we see at the beginning is the reason behind the parable. Now, we've got to remember, you know, we look at we look at the parables oftentimes, and uh, we just take take the 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 parable itself. But I hope that I've been sharing with you, and maybe I've been repeating it, and I don't apologize for that. But we've got to remember the context of the of the passage, and so if if you think about it, we could we could step into just an everyday conversation halfway through. And we might get the wrong idea of what's going on. That's exactly what happens with uh, some of the teachings in the scriptures. People take a, a small section out of the Bible without recognizing the, the broader context or the immediate context. By that I mean, you know, what is the letter that we're looking at? Why is this being said? And specifically, what is the 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 conditions that lead up to this piece of writing so we're starting in verse 25 which gives us the context of what it is and a lawyer stood up and put him to the test and that's a key and put him to the test saying teacher what shall i do to inherit eternal life and he said to him what is written in the law how does it read to you now, as a side point here, as I've got older, I've realized that what I was told in school and my dear uh, uh, departed mother used to tell me, you don't answer a question with a question. Well, my friends, that's just, that's just wrong uh, because you may not understand the question and there, there may be the question may be weighted in such a way as to put you in a difficult position. Jesus often 
answer the question with a question. So this lawyer, now a lawyer, he he wasn't someone who was uh, like went to the law courts and studied law in the way that we think of it now. He was an expert in the law of Moses, right? So you can see it's a little bit different from how we understand it. And, and so what Jesus is saying, what is written in the law, how does it read to you? It says, he says, you are the expert. You should tell us uh, what to do to etern uh, eternal life. See, Jesus turns it back on him. Uh, so the test now is on the lawyer. Verse 27. And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and live. <laughs> so, so Jesus didn't have to actually answer it. If this lawyer only did what he knew the law taught, he would do well. But notice verse 28. Now we, we can see the, the, um, the character of these people. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Okay, that's verse 29. And what this does for us is this gives us the context of it. it this is not a nice, friendly conversation, you know, where everyone's on the same side. There is conflict. There, the, these are, this lawyer was the sort of person that wanted to put Jesus to death. There was conflict and there was anguish and there was anger going on here. Uh, and so we can see what the real question is and who is my neighbor? You know, we all kind of get this sort of question in our mind. You know, we, we, are, we know that we have to love everyone and love our neighbor. But, you know, there are some people that perhaps we don't really want to love. Some people that we think are not nice. And if we, if we think of it honestly, that translates to, well, they're not really worthy. And this is really where the position this man was. He wanted a nice line drawn where he could say, okay, these group of people, well, you see, they are my neighbors, but this group over here, well, I don't want to love them. They're not my neighbors. So he asks, and who is my neighbor? Verse 30, Jesus replied, and said, oh, what's going on here? Jesus replied and, sa and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. And they stripped him and beat him and, and went away and leaving him half dead. And my chance of priest was going down the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came up to him, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged his wounds and poured oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor of the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy to him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Okay, now can you realize that all this parable was about the question, and who is my neighbor? Now, Jesus asks the question 
right at the end of the parable. You notice there in verse 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor of the man who fell into the robber's hands? Well, <laughs> I'm sure that this lawyer would have liked to have been able to say the priest. You know, they're highly regarded in, in those days. And it would have been wonderful for the lawyer to say, well, the priest, uh, you know, the honor that we bestow on them is, is well-founded. But he couldn't. Same with a, a, a Levite. And they're, they're, of course, the Levites, while they were not priests, they worked uh, for, for the priests and for the temple. No, it was the Samaritan. But I want you to notice that in verse 37, the lawyer could not even bring himself to say that word, the Samaritan, the one who showed mercy to him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. That's the lesson for us. We need to go and do the same. But we, we're getting ahead of ourselves. What I want to do now is go and we're going to have a little history lesson about the Samaritans. Now, you, you of course, we all recognize just by the, the title uh, of the parable but the hero of the story, the one who was truly the neighbor was a Samaritan. But, but who are the Samaritans? You see, the Jews despised the Samaritans. They didn't trust them. They hated them. They would have nothing to do with them. But who were the Samaritans? Well, I've got a little chart here. Bear with me while I get it up. Okay, so I want you to notice here the uh this this chart that we have here now over here we the thing with with uh with with uh, looking at the maps of the bible land is that we need to uh orientate ourselves properly now i've got another map we got we got a number of maps that i'm going to be looking at today here Okay, so this is a larger scale map, and it's the it's the map of the divided kingdom. We'll talk about that in the, in, in a little little bit here. But when we think of the, the we'll call it the Holy Land because it has many different names. We can see we have the 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 Great Sea or the the Mediterranean Sea here on the on the on the west coast and then you've got the two lakes or the two seas we've got the the sea of galilee here and we've got the dead sea here okay those uh make my line a little bit bigger if i can okay no not going to work that. Okay, so, and in between them, you've got the Jordan River running down here. Now, let's go back to our, our original map over here. Now, you can see we've got the Jordan River coming down here. And here is Samaria. It's in between Judea and Galilee. Now, Whenever the Jews would want to travel from Jerusalem, which was down here somewhere, up to Galilee, they would take a long road cross. Well, they'd actually come through Jericho. Now, this is the this is the road that uh, we in the parable. They'd cross over the Jordan and come up this way, and then come back around here, so they did not have to pass through uh, Galilee. Uh, not Galilee. They didn't have to pass through. Uh, Samaria, because they hated Samaria so much. Okay, now, go over to, uh, to uh, in your Bibles to John chapter, chapter 3, and we read of, uh, no, John chapter 4, uh, and let's see, okay. 
Notice what we read there. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although he, Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. And then he came to the city, the, the city of Samaria called Sychar, and near the parcel of ground Jacob gave to his son, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting by the well about the sixth hour. Now, this is the, the, the passage about the woman from Samaria, as you can see here. Now, I want to go, I'm here for a specific reason. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of uh, uh, discussion going on here. Uh, but notice verse 19. So uh, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know, we worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipper will worship the Father in spirit and truth. To such people, the Father seeks to be his worshippers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, I'm particularly interested in this verse 20 here. Notice what it says here. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Let's go back to our map. Now, notice here. The mountain is Mount Gerizim. This is the place where this woman was talking about. Sashim was where they were. Okay. Now, what she was saying was that we Samaritans worshipped on Mount Gerizim. But we know all the Jews and the law of Moses told the Jews to worship in uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, and so this was a major problem that uh, that they had there. Now, I said we're going to go into the history of Samaria. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to realize that uh, after the... Where are we? Okay. Sometimes it appears that I don't know what I'm doing. And they've got pen marks all over this. The reason it appears that is because sometimes I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm learning and I'm trying new things. Okay, now you notice this map here is entitled the Divided Kingdom. You remember the, the you don't need to remember all the kings of uh, of uh, uh, of Judah, but we know the first king was uh, Saul. The people demanded a king. And they were given Saul, who was a wicked man, and treated them very badly. Then David came up, and he was a man of war, uh, and, and expanded the, the, the area greatly. His son, Solomon, uh, who had been brought up well, uh, did a good job for the first half of his uh, kingship. But he was led astray by the various women that he had married, and he built uh, places for their idol worship. And then his son Rehoboam, at the death of, uh, of uh, Solomon, he took the kingdom, and he was just a bad king, and he divided the kingdom so that you have what was once one kingdom you now have Israel here, the northern kingdom, and Judah. Now, the northern kingdom was made up of 10 tribes, and the southern kingdom was made of the tribe of, of Judah and Benjamin, two tribes. Now, the, the tribes of Judah, uh, oh, sorry, the, the kings of Judah some were good and some were very bad. There was not one good king of Israel. And because of that, the Lord punished them. And he punished them before 
he punished uh, uh, Judah. Now notice, we're going to go over to 1 Kings chapter 16. Here, bear with me. In the first year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri became king of Israel and reigned 12 years. Now you'll often you'll often read when you're reading through first and second kings and first and second chronicles, you get the two kingdoms with the, the two kings. And so you can actually keep track of what's happening where. So we've got Asa, the king of Judah, uh, that's the southern kingdom, and Omri became the king of Israel. He reigned 12 years, he reigned for six years in Tirzah, uh, and he bought the hill Samaria from Shema for two talents of silver. And he built on the hill and named the city which he built Samaria. And after the name, uh, after the name Shema, the owner of the hill. Okay, so we've got this because we've got now, now the root of the name uh, Samaria. Okay, let's go over to 2 Kings uh, chapter 17. There's wickedness being going on generation after generation. And then the king of Assyria invaded the whole land and went up to Samaria. Now, that was where the capital was, right? It's no longer for, for, for Israel, the northern kingdom. Jerusalem, of course, was not their capital. Their capital was now Samaria. They went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of the Assyrians captured Samaria and carried Israel away into exile in Assyria and settled them in Hala and Habor on the river Gozan in the city of the Medes. So during the Assyrian Empire, the northern kingdom of Israel was captured and carried away. Well, what happened to the inhabitants of the land? Well, you read that there'll be some of some of Israel left, but it was repopulated. Now let's go over here. Okay, so we're, what we're doing, I'll go down to the bottom and give you the 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 um the scripture reference. Second Kings 17, 24 to 28. So so the Israelites have been taken out. What, so what happens next? The king of Assyria, Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Putha and Avar and from Hamath and Sarpharim <clears throat> and settled them in the city of Samaria in place of the sons of Israel. So we have this, this movement of people into this area. These were not Israelites. These were not sons of Abraham. So they possessed uh, Samaria and lived in its cities. At the beginning of the living there, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. So they spoke to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations whom you have carried away into exile in the cities of Samaria do not know the customs of the gods of the land. So... Uh, he has sent lions among them. Behold, they kill them because they do not know the customs of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Take one of the priests whom you carried away into exile and let him go and live there. And let him, let him teach them the customs of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they carried away into exile from Samaria came and lived in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Okay, now it's taken uh, taken longer than uh, I had planned, but it's very important that we understand that. So what we've got here is now we've got people living in the land we know as Samaria, the Samaritans. They don't know the one and only living God. They have a priest sent from captivity in Babylon. Now, he was a priest of Israel. But they were already worshipping in, in, a, in a strange way that uh, God had not commanded them. If we go, if we go, back, to, if we go back to our maps, uh, let me just get over here. 
If we go back to our maps, we'll notice something very interesting. Israel did not worship in Jerusalem. You see Jerusalem down here in Judah, okay? So here's Jerusalem. They worshipped in Bethel and to the north, Dan, way, way up in the north. That's the two places they, they worshipped, in Bethel and Dan. So Israel did not worship correctly, but they have a priest who at least knows the one and only living God, even if he's worshipping uh, falsely, and he's the one that teaches them. So it's no wonder that hundreds of years later, we see what is now the Roman region of Samaria that is so far from the truth. And the Jews hated them. That's the whole point. The Jews despised them. They wouldn't even talk to them. They wouldn't even go through their country. They left them well and truly alone. But of course, Jesus wasn't like that at all. Jesus went to the Samaritans and he taught them and he helped them and he preached the gospel to them. So let us go back to our, um, our, our, our parable here in Luke chapter 10. Okay. Now we notice the, the main key of this parable is we got this man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, this was a very dangerous road, apparently. Robbers were common. And they beat him, stripped him, stole everything from him, left him half dead. Now, the priest... Now, you've got to remember, the priests, first of all, were members of the tribe of Levi, but they also had to be sons of Aaron. You, the, the genealogies are essentials for, essential for the Jews. They had to be able to trace back to their great-great-great-great-great-grandfather. Well, that was Aaron, the first high priest. And so, very prestigious position to be a priest. Uh, John the Baptist's father uh, was a priest. Uh, he was a son of Aaron. Uh, and you would expect great things from a priest, but he passed by on the other side. As I mentioned when we were uh, looking uh, the first time at this, the, the Levite, now he wasn't a priest because he wasn't a son of Aaron, but he was from the tribe of Levi, a very prestigious tribe to be a part of. And he passed by on the other side. Now the Samaritan, this is the one that everyone despised. He was on a journey. He came upon him and notice he felt compassion. He, in, in, we see in our, in our uh, um, definition here, to be moved with pity or compassion. And his, it wasn't just a feeling that he had in his heart. He did something about it. He bandaged him. Uh, bandaged up his wounds, pour oil and wine on them. That was the medicine of the day. Put him on his own beast and brought him to the inn and took care of him. Not only that, but he, he looked after him all night. He had to move on, but he left money with the innkeeper and told the innkeeper to take care of him. And if, if you need to spend more money, go ahead, just spend it and I'll repay you. This is the neighbor. So, Jesus says that we have to be those who show mercy. We have to do the same. That's what we have to do. Now, let's have a look at uh, some other passages in the scripture because we get wonderful example from Jesus himself. Now, we'll start in Philippians 1. As Philippians 2, verse 1, rather. Therefore, if there is any encouragement of Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if there is any affection and compassion, make my joy complete. 
by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. This is a nutshell of what the Samaritan did. We have to have the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. We don't look out for ourselves, we look out for others. But it goes on, because it tells us that Jesus is the perfect example of this. Verse 5, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of as a man, as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason, God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You see, Jesus humbled himself. He gave up everything, and he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, the, the, the worst type of death you could ever imagine. So this is the beauty of serving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything that he wouldn't do himself, that he hasn't done already. So when we are told to love our neighbor, we know how we have to love our neighbors. He gives us the example. Notice Romans chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 6 there. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love to us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we should be saved from the wrath of God through him. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, we shall, be, we shall also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the reconciliation. You see, when Jesus says we need to love our neighbor, he's not talking about the good neighbors. He's talking about all the neighbors. You know, maybe we've got good neighbors we're best friends with. That's easy. That's easy. But while we were enemies, God loved us and gave his son for our lives. That's what we have to be. Now, I want to go over to the writings of the Apostle John. We're going to start in the Gospel of John, in John 13, uh, starting in verse 34. Now, John's writing is full of what our love has to be like. Notice, this is quoting Jesus here, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this, all men will know that you are disciples, if you have love one for another. Love is a major theme that John goes through. We're going to go to, to uh, the epistle of First John now, and notice a, a number of uh, chapters chapter 2, then 3, and then 4. But we're looking at uh, John, 1 John 2, verses 7 to 11. Beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, 
which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother and abides in the light, there is no cause for stumbling him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. This, this wonderful, wonderful teaching on love. Chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's good and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us love, let us not love with word or tongue, but with deed and truth. Now, chapter four. You can, I told you there was tremendous wealth here, uh, starting in uh, verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifest in us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You know the teachings on love. The Bible is a book about the love of God for his children. And the thing is, the love does not stop with those people who are loving to us. That's not what love is all about. The Bible makes it very clear that love is not something that just relies on something coming to us. You know, the world will teach you that. That love is some it, it, it's an emotion, something that that we 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 feel. And, and you you'll hear people say that I just don't feel the love. In Australia, we have a, a shameful, shameful statistic where half of all marriages end up in divorce. And oftentimes is because they no longer love the person. And this is very selfish because the sort of love they're talking about is these emotions and emotions come and go. Let's face it. We all have days when we're feeling happy and we all have days when we're feeling sad. That's, that's how emotions work. If we base love on emotions and that those emotions often feed on what we receive, well, we're going to have no love at all. But that's not how the Bible defines love. When we read that God so loved the world in John 3, 16, we don't read he loved the world because the world loved God. And that's what, what uh, John wrote in 1 John chapter 4. We love because... Not that love, love came from us first, but love came from God. And so we have to realize that the love for our neighbor is not something that is based on emotion. It's something based on the love, the type of love that comes from God. We see this, what the love is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse four and on, love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous, love does not brag, and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, does not seek its own, is not provoked, 
does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. You see, have a look at this description of love. The love is something that goes from us outward. Love is not, the love that the Bible talks about is not dependent on anyone else. This is how we can love all our neighbors. This is how we can love our enemies. We just have to be patient and kind and not jealous and all these other things. How do we love someone who does bad things against us? Uh, love does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. You know, the Lord understands that we are going to be wronged. But he says, love, don't take into account of that. One of the greatest ways that we can show love to the world is by sharing the gospel. By sharing the gospel, we do what Jesus did. We share the fact that there is salvation for us all. There is hope for us all. In what looks like a hopeless world, there is hope. Now, my friends, the lesson is that we have to love our neighbors. Now, the question was made earlier in the week when considering this. Well, you know, people come and ask me for this and ask me for that. They say, I've got more than them. They should be giving me more. That, that, that isn't the love that we're talking about here. The Bible says that, that, that the love that's talking about is when we see a brother or sister in need, we help them, not in want. You know, I, I get, just yesterday, I got a, a, a bill sent to me, uh, someone's daughter's school fees, uh, and with the expectation that I would pay it. I, I, I cannot pay everyone's school fees. You know, I, I paid for my own son's school fees. I've been asked to, to help someone go to university. Well, my son got two jobs to pay for his own university. Now, we're, we're not expected to help everyone who asks us, but we are to, expected to help those who are in real need. Now, that's a topic for another lesson, but want is not need. There's a difference. Want is not need. We are taught in the scriptures as Christians that we need to work to look after our family. It's as simple as that and not be a burden on others. Okay, it's time for our video now. Let me... Get that up. Hello and welcome back. If this is the first time you've joined us, my name is Keith Thompson. I'm with the Armadale Church of Christ here in beautiful Western Australia. And we're continuing in our study in the parables of Jesus Christ. This week, we're going to be looking at the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, this may be a story that you think you're very familiar with. It's a story often used for children. But there's a lot more to this story than just to entertain children. Let's, let's read the parable. It's found in, Matthew, uh, in Luke rather, chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 30 to 37. Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Verse 31. And by chance a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place, he saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, 
whom, who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and put, his on his, put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, The one whom show, who showed mercy to him. And Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. Well, that's the parable that Jesus taught about this poor unfortunate who fell among robbers. And the priest and the Levite didn't have anything to do with them, but it was the Samaritan. But, but what was, the, what was the, the, the purpose of this parable? Why did Jesus teach this in the first place? To do that, we've got to go back a few verses. Let's go to Luke 10, verse 25, and notice there. And the lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify him, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? You see, it's in answer to that question and who is my neighbor that Jesus gave us this parable uh, and so we can see this was in answer to a test that Jesus was answering this parable this lawyer while he answered correctly concerning loving the Lord your God and loving your neighbor you can see his heart wasn't right and so Jesus teaches this parable. Uh, the thing was, this man sought to justify himself. And unfortunately, there are many people like that today. Uh, the idea of loving, loving our neighbor is a difficult thing. Do we want to just love any old person? Or the people we know and like? And this is what this parable is all about. So, so let's have a look at what this parable is telling us. First of all, he tells us in verse 30, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now this road, the Jerusalem to Jericho road, was a notoriously dangerous road. And it was, it was filled with robbers. Now, we're not told anything much about this man. We assume he's coming from Jerusalem, going to Jericho. We assume that he's a Jewish man, but we don't know. But we see that he's in a terrible, terrible state. He's not just robbed, but he's beaten and left half dead. And well, you can imagine if, if he was conscious, he'd, he'd open half an eye and down the road, it looked like a savior was coming because there was a, a priest coming. Now, a priest was a, a son of Levi, a son of Aaron. It was only, only, only the, the sons of Aaron could act as priests. And these are the ones that served in the temple of God as representatives of all the people. Surely this man was going to help him. He was going to give him the, the, the care that he needed. But he passed by on the other side. Well, next came a Levite. Now, he's not a priest, but he is one of the sons of, uh, of, our, uh, of, of Levi. Once again, he passed by on the other side. Then there comes a Samaritan. Now, a Samaritan was one who was despised by the Jews. They didn't worship in Jerusalem. They had changed the teachings of the Old Testament, and the Jews would have nothing to do with this man. In fact, if you were going to give an insult to anyone, you would call him a Samaritan. Well, what did this Samaritan do? Let's read verse 33 and 34 again. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and he saw him and felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged his wounds and poured oil and wine on them and put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
This is a remarkable man. It didn't matter who the poor soul on the road was. This man showed compassion for him and went out of his way to help him, to take care of him. And then we read as we go on that he, he told the innkeeper to take care of him and even paid uh, for his care. This man truly showed compassion. He truly showed love. Well, this put the lawyer in a bit of a situation. Because we read uh, in verse 36 where Jesus said, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? <laughs> there's, there's only one possible answer. Anyone with, with half a brain could understand this. But I want you to notice that this lawyer could not even say the word, the Samaritan. Verse 37. And he said, the one who showed mercy to him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. He couldn't say Samaritan, but he recognized. He recognized who the neighbor was. You see, everyone is our neighbor. We've got to look after and care for everyone. And this follows just what Jesus uh, taught us in John 3, 16, where he said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world. That's who our neighbors are. Our love has to go beyond the boundaries of our property, the, the boundaries of our neighborhood, the boundaries of our country. Whoever God put on this earth is our neighbor. Notice what we read uh, over in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus is, is a very similar passage there. Ma uh, Matthew 22 verses 34 to 40. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, what is the greatest command of the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all, uh, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. This is Jesus telling us that yes, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and spirit, and love your neighbor as yourself. Paul uh, repeats this very thing in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, where he says, You are called to freedom, brethren. Do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the, that's the story of the Good Samaritan. Our neighbors are all around us. And if we see anyone in need, we need to be like that Samaritan and show compassion to them. It's difficult. No, no, no one said that being a Christian is easy. But this is what we see in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This love that they brought down to us that we need to share with our neighbors. Thank you once again for being with us. And we hope to see you next time. Goodbye. Okay. There you go. Now, questions, comments. I'm very happy uh, for you to uh, to share with us now. That is a wonderful study, Brother K. Thank you. And, and thank you so much. I just wanted a clarification on the two scriptures that we have read on the study. First in Matthew, just, you just read in the video, 
22nd in verses 34. And then to our study in, in Luke chapter 10, what are these two lawyers? Um, what do you think uh, the first lawyer in um, who had read the whole law in Matthew chapter 22 knew about the response of Christ about the greatest commandment? And in Luke chapter 10, this uh, lawyer who has been asked to narrate the commandment, and then he says, love God, you are God with all your heart, with all your mind. So did the first lawyer in, Matthew, in chapter 22 of Matthew knew about the law of Moses laws, about the first commandment? And was it effective to the effect to the first to the second lawyer in Luke chapter 10? So what was that last bit? Was it effective? Yes, was was this response um effective? Um in short, I'm asking, was the law of Jesus Christ working during this time when this lawyer is was 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 responding? Okay, yep. Okay, uh, this was this Jesus lived and died under the law of Moses, but even under the law of Moses, the 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 lawyer we read in Luke, he knew it for certain, right? So the the lawyer in Luke said all that Jesus said here in Matthew. There's two lawyers. Two occasions. Uh, but but I want, want you to notice what Jesus does here. He's asked for the greatest commandment, right? Uh, and he says, love the Lord your God. That's number one. But once again, he, he doesn't allow the, the questioner to dictate the conversation. He then says the second greatest love your neighbor as yourself now uh let's have a look um okay i'm going to go over to leviticus 19 and verse 8 because there's a note note here uh under love your neighbor as yourself I think it's that's right. 18, I beg your pardon. Okay. Uh, so, under the old law, book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verses 17 and 18, you shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but you shall not incur sin because of him. You shall not take revenge, or, sorry, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So Jesus, Jesus is extending who the neighbors are. Over, over here in Leviticus, it's talking about the sons of, of Israel, right? But Jesus is like, like he did with the whole concept. You know, we, you think of the uh, the old the, the law of Moses was a national law. That's why there's so many of these commands because not only did they have to serve God, but they had to run the country with these laws. As Christians, we follow the laws of the land, and all we have to worry about in the in the New Testament is serving God. But here, they had to not take vengeance on their brothers. Jesus extended that, said, well, who is the neighbor? The Samaritan showed who the neighbor was. We are all neighbors. We are all brothers under the sun. Everyone who is born, we could say, is a son of God because they are descendants of, of Adam. So, it fits in exactly with what Jesus said. And, and you've got to imagine that over the three, three and a half years that Jesus preached, he had so many conversations. 
we only have uh, a, a handful of those recorded for us in the New Testament. Uh, I think it's John, right at the end of one of the Gospels anyway, that says, yeah, I think it is John, that Jesus did and said many other things. If, if, if they were written down in books, even the world wouldn't be large enough to contain the books. But in that, we see that there are a lot of similar conversations that uh, Jesus had and similar teachings, really the same teachings in this case. Okay. So no, uh, they weren't living under the law of Christ. Christ's law had not taken taken place, but he was he was showing the extent of his law by the fact that a neighbor was more than just an Israelite. And that's, I think that's why he chose a, a Samaritan, the hate of Samaritan. Okay. 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 Anyone else? Okay. okay. Dominic, why don't you unmute yourself again and close in a prayer for us? Okay, sure. Thank you so much, brother, and all the brethren who have had an opportunity to study. Let us close with a word of prayer. Our God in heaven, we thank you so much because of this wonderful day, a Saturday that has started with blessings to study your word together with brothers and sisters across the globe. We thank you because of all the listeners, we thank you because of the teacher, Brother Keith, who has given his time to be able to study with us through this internet that you have given us. We thank you because of all who have made it. I pray that, Lord, the study about this beautiful lesson about good neighbors will well bring to our hearts and it shall continue to grow us spiritually as we make other disciples. I pray that, Lord, you shall also help us to share with other people around our locations. I pray that, Lord, as we depart right now, we're departing knowing that this is a great word that you've given to us and it will continue to bear fruits to your people each and every day. I pray for blessings to everyone. I pray for providence. I pray for all needs that people may be having here, should it be school fees, should it be meals, or any other struggles in life, Lord, I pray that you will provide for them. We also thank you because of the many blessings that you've given to us. I pray because of our country, Kenya, and even the place where we had fire tragedy that killed many people and many injured, Lord, you shall continue to be with the families and even those still in the hospitals. I pray because of Israel and many other nations struggling through conflicts. Lord, I pray that you will grant peace because you are the source of peace. I pray that you will continue to unite your people. I pray for blessings to all the governments in the world. I want to bless the Lord's church that you purchased through your blood. That Lord, as we gather tomorrow for worship, you will continue to be with us and lead us according to your word. I pray that, Lord, you shall continue to be with us and also forgive our transgressions in any way we've gone straight before you. I pray this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Okay, it's good seeing you all here. We've had a great crowd. Uh, thank you so much, every single one of you. Uh, Lord willing, we'll meet again next uh, Saturday. You have a great day tomorrow. Uh, I'll say goodbye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, okay. everyone.